actually, I first learned from the internet news, and uh, I was completely shocked. I even cannot finish the, the news. Okay, once I saw the picture, I just think, I mean, I cannot believe this is four men but all gone. I mean, it's just complete shock. Okay, what's your message to Anjang Du, who's still on the run, and anyone who may well be harboring him? What would you say to them? If he, what I mean, do okay. If he really did that, so far still suspect. But if he really did that, I have many, many, many questions to ask him. Among them, the most the question that strikes me mostly, you know, the only one question that strikes me most is, I want to ask him. How could you step a knife into an innocent girl's heart? Not once, but twice. On July fifteenth, two thousand eleven, Mr. Ding Ji Tong gave his first media interview in Northampton, UK. He had just flown in from the U.S. to attend the memorial service for his brother, Ding Ji Feng. Speaking about the tragic fate of his brother's family of four. Mr. Ding Ji Tong tried to contain his inner rage and expressed his indignation towards the perpetrator, Duan Tong. So, who is Duan Tong, and why did he commit such a brutal crime? Join us at Crime Documentary Files as we delve into today's case. Northampton is the third largest town in the UK, with a population of around 250,000. It is located 78 kilometers from Birmingham, 96 kilometers from London. And is one of London's significant satellite towns. The main character Ding Ji Feng and his family also resided here. Ding Ji Feng was born on May 26, 1964. His wife Kui Ge was born on April 4, 1964. They were both from Hangzhou and classmates in the chemistry department at university. In the early 1990s, the trend of studying abroad and emigrating overseas began to gain popularity in China. This young couple joined the trend and chose the UK as their destination for studying abroad. Later, Ding Ji Feng went abroad for further studies and obtained a PhD in chemistry in the UK. Shortly after, his wife also earned a master's degree there. With their high educational qualifications and extensive work experience, they successfully settled in the UK. During this time in 1993, they welcomed their first daughter, Ding Xin. Six years later, in 1999, they had their second daughter, Ding Huan. In the same year, Kui Ge, with her keen business sense, opened an herbal medicine store in the small town of Roberton in Northampton, naming it Herb Magic. Ding Ji Feng and his wife managed the store together for about a year, but the business was not very successful. The main reason was that both of them had studied chemistry and were not professional traditional Chinese medicine doctors. So they lacked experience in pharmacology and herbal medicine preparation. Therefore, they invited a few traditional Chinese medicine doctors to collaborate, but the business still did not improve. At this point, the arrival of Duan Tong and his wife Chen Zan brought new life to their herbal medicine store. Duan Tong was born on December 2nd, 1958, in Hunan Province. He and his wife Chen Zan both graduated from the Hunan Traditional Chinese Medicine Institute, now Hunan University of Chinese Medicine. As formally trained traditional Chinese medicine doctors, Duan Tong and his wife had worked for many years in China, accumulating substantial experience in traditional medicine. In search of better opportunities, in 1998, Duan Tong, along with his wife and young son, moved to the UK on a work visa. There, they worked at the Dr. Herb's chain of stores under Tian Tian Pharmaceuticals. By early 2000, through mutual friends, Kui Ge met the traditional Chinese medicine doctor Chen Zan. After a few meetings, the relationship between the two families grew closer. Soon after, Ding Ji Feng and Kui Ge decided to invite Duan Tong to work at their herbal medicine store. This was a mutually beneficial decision for both families. The Ding family gained an experienced traditional Chinese medicine doctor as a partner who could help with quality control, procurement, and preparation of herbal medicines, which was crucial for the store. In return, Du and Tong not only secured the opportunity to apply for permanent residency in the UK, but also earned more money, transitioning from an employee to a partner with partial management rights of the store. 
After discussions, on February 24, 2000, Herb Magic changed its ownership structure. Initially, Ding Ji Feng and Kui Gay each held 50% of the shares. But now, Kui Gay would hold 99% of the shares, and Duan Tong would hold 1%. Regarding the reason why Duan Tong held only 1% of the shares, Kui Gay explained that due to his work visa, he was legally permitted to work only as a traditional Chinese medicine doctor. If he were to become a shareholder, his ownership could not exceed 1% according to the law. However, the 1% was merely symbolic. Kui Gay and Duan Tong had agreed to split the profits equally, with Duan Tong receiving 50%. Yet these were only verbal agreements, which would later become the source of significant conflicts. In reality, since Duan Tong began working at Kui Gay's herbal medicine store, Herb Magic saw a substantial increase in sales. His extensive knowledge of traditional Chinese medicine and expertise in herbal preparation quickly earned the trust of customers. At this time, the number of Chinese students and immigrants in the UK was rising, leading to increased demand for herbal medicine. Thanks to Duan Tong's contributions, Herb Magic became highly successful within a few short months. Recognizing the immense business potential, in 2001, Kui Gay opened two more branches in Coventry and Cheltenham. Owning three herbal medicine stores made her a well-known figure in the Chinese community and one of the earliest successful herbal medicine store owners. However, business partnerships are never easy. Despite the outward success of the three branches, over time, conflicts between Duan Tong and Kui Gay grew and became increasingly difficult to resolve. According to Duan Tong's family, Kui Gay gradually started concealing financial reports and withholding information from Duan Tong. Therefore, Duan Tong never knew exactly how much money the herbal store was making. He felt that the business was doing well, but the amount he received in profit sharing was not significant. More importantly, according to their original agreement, Kui Gay and Duan Tong were supposed to split the profits equally, but Kui Gay often delayed payments, causing him great frustration. On the other hand, according to Kui Gay's family, she was busy with other outside work and couldn't manage the store's finances daily. As a result, Duan Tong took advantage of her absence to secretly take some cash from the store. Consequently, Kui Gay believed that Duan Tong was stealing money from the store and thought that if he had already taken some cash, she shouldn't split the profits equally anymore. In 2001, the issue of Duan Tong taking money led them to involve the police. Duan Tong admitted to taking cash from the store, but maintained that as a shareholder and one of the store's owners, it was normal for him to do so. The police viewed this as a financial dispute and did not file a report, advising them to resolve the matter in court if they couldn't reconcile. Eventually, under police mediation, Kui Gay and Duan Tong reached an agreement. Kui Gay decided not to pursue the cash Duan Tong had taken. But from that point on, the two families were completely estranged. Kui Gay, being very astute, realized she could no longer cooperate with Duan Tong. On July 25, 2001, she partnered with an English friend named Paul Delaney to open another herbal medicine store named Herbs for Health. Duan Tong was not to be outdone. After obtaining permanent residency in the UK in 2002, he opened his own herbal medicine store in April 2002, naming it Jade Herbs. This marked the official end of his partnership with Kui Gay. However, within a few years, he closed Jade Herbs. Duan Tong then founded Fukong Pharmaceuticals and opened another herbal medicine store named Natural Health at the Pavilion Shopping Center in Birmingham. In November 2002, Duan Tong and his wife spent $100,000 to purchase their first home in Coventry. Meanwhile, Ding Ji Feng and Kui Gay diversified their business ventures. Starting in 2004, Ding Ji Feng began working as a senior lecturer in the Department of Chemistry and Environmental Science at Manchester Metropolitan University. Kui Gay, in addition to managing the herbal medicine store, also worked as a Chinese language teacher at Caroline Chisholm School, where their youngest daughter, Ding Huan, was a student. Although everyone seemed to have moved on with their lives, Duan Tong persisted in reclaiming the money Kui Gay had owed him. After years of unsuccessful negotiations and refusals from the Ding family, Duan Tong decided in 2007 to take Ding Jifeng's family to court. 
He demanded that Kuige pay the amount owed to him from 2000 to 2002, as he had only received a small portion of the initially agreed upon sum. After receiving the court summons, Kuige began transferring her assets to avoid a judgment by putting all her herbal medicine stores up for sale. During the trial, seeing a high possibility of losing, Kuige attempted to transfer her assets to others just days before the court ruling. On November 12, 2007, the local court ruled against Kui Ge, ordering her to pay $30,000 in attorney fees to Du Antong. As for the profits from the herbal medicine stores, the judge indicated that a separate trial would be held to address this issue. Kui Ge subsequently agreed to comply with the court's ruling and paid over $30,000 in attorney fees. However, six months later, on May 7, 2008, the judge determined that Kui Ge had only paid about 40% of what Duan Tong was entitled to during their partnership, ruling that Kui Ge must pay the remaining 60%, which amounted to approximately $30,000. The judge also granted Duan Tong's lawyer's request to freeze Kui Ge's assets to ensure payment. However, before Duan Tong could celebrate the court's decision, Kui Ge demonstrated her cunning. The very next day, at 9 a.m. on May 8th, Kui Ge successfully sold the house where her family had lived for six years. On the same day she sold the house, Kui Ge filed for bankruptcy. Importantly, although the judge's ruling was made on May 7th, the legal documentation required one to two days for judicial registration to take effect. As a result, Kui Ge's house sale occurred faster than the judicial registration process. Kui Ge sold the house on May 8th, while the judicial registration was completed on May 9th. Therefore, legally, by the time the asset freeze order in the judgment took effect, Kui Ge was already in bankruptcy. According to UK law, if Kui Ge was bankrupt, she would no longer be required to pay the $30,000 in profits to Duan Tong. Although Kui Ge's actions were quite cunning, legally, she committed no crime. Upon learning this outcome, Duan Tong had no choice but to accept it bitterly. The matter should have ended here. Despite not recovering the $30,000 owed to him, Duan Tong didn't have to pay legal fees, won the lawsuit, preserved his dignity, and regained a sense of justice. However, a few months later, Duan Tong discovered that Kui Ge and Ding Jifeng's family of four were still living in the old house. In theory, wasn't that house sold after the ruling? He then quickly investigated this matter thoroughly. According to real estate sale records, Kui Ge and Ding Ji Feng purchased their house on May 8, 2002, for $250,000. However, six years later, on the day of the judgment, May 8, 2008, they sold it for the much lower price of $210,000. Although Duan Tong was not in the real estate business, he knew this was highly suspicious. According to market evaluations, Kui Ge's house should have been worth around $270,000. This means Kui Ge sold the house for 20% below its market value on the day of the judgment. More importantly, the buyer of the house was none other than Kui Ge's English business partner. After uncovering all these details, Duan Tong felt he had been deceived by Kui Ge. It was clear that the house sale was a scheme by Kui Ge to transfer assets before filing for bankruptcy. After consulting with his lawyer, Duan Tong filed another lawsuit, taking both Kui Ge and Paul Delaney to court. He accused them of conducting an illegal transaction at an obviously unreasonable price within a short period, essentially aiming to transfer assets. This lawsuit lasted for two years. During this time, to prepare for the worst possible outcome, Du Antong also started transferring assets held in his name. On January 6, 2010, he resigned as director of Fu Kang Pharmaceuticals and transferred ownership of the company to his son, while he and his wife retained only shares in the company. Fortunately, in May 2010, after intense courtroom debates, Duan Tong won the lawsuit once again. The judge ruled that the real estate transaction between Kui Ge and Paul Delaney was void. However, Kui Ge and Delaney did not accept this verdict and appealed to the high court. Despite winning the case, Duan Tong faced increasing pressure from the appeal. In a media interview, his wife revealed that to counter Kui Ge and Delaney's appeal, Duan Tong had to gather various documents, contact lawyers, and devote all his energy to the case. By the end of 2010, 
the High Court concluded that although the sale price of the house between Quige and Delaney was clearly below market value and the transaction was done in a short period, which seemed unreasonable, there was an important clause in the transaction. Paul Delaney had agreed to lease the house back to Quige for 21 years. In other words, Delaney had foregone part of his benefits to secure a lower purchase price. Therefore, the High Court ruled that the transaction did not violate principles of fairness and was legally valid, resulting in Du Tong losing the case. By Monday morning, May 1st, there was still no news about Du Tong. The West Midlands Police Department sent officers to Kui Gay's house to inquire if they knew anything about Du Tong's whereabouts. After knocking on the door for a while with no response, the officers assumed no one was home and left a card in the mailbox requesting Kui Gay to contact the police as soon as possible, then left. However, around 6 p.m. that same day, the situation became more complicated. A man named Jason Horsley called the police station, reporting that he was a neighbor of Kui Gay's family and that something was wrong. He urged the police to come immediately. Jason explained that in the afternoon, an elderly Indian woman, who had been friends with the Kui Gay family since 2002, came to his door. She mentioned that she hadn't seen any activity at Kui Gay's house for several days. On April 29th, the day of the royal wedding, their neighborhood had hosted many community events. However, Kui Gay's daughters, 18-year-old Ding Shin and 12-year-old Ding Huan, who usually loved participating in community activities, were not seen. Additionally, the curtains at Kui Gay's house had been drawn all weekend with no one going in or out, which was highly unusual. After hearing the elderly woman's account, Jason accompanied her to Kui Gay's house. When no one answered the front door, he went around to the back through the garden. Through the kitchen window and the curtains, Jason saw a dark brown stain on the floor. Upon closer inspection, he noticed a pair of human legs. Terrified, he rushed back home and called the police. To better understand the crime scene, let's take a look at the 3D model created by the police. Kui Gay's family home is a two-story house with a detached garage and a pathway leading to the backyard. The second floor has four rooms, the master bedroom in the bottom left corner, two bedrooms for the daughters, and a small sitting room. The first floor includes the living room, dining room, and kitchen, with a back door from the kitchen opening to the backyard. The first officers on the scene were Officer John Campbell and Chinese Officer Wang Cheng Yi. Upon arrival, Officer Campbell broke through the back door to enter the house. He found Kui Gay in her pajamas, slumped beside the kitchen. Moving further inside, he saw Ding Ji Feng lying collapsed beneath the fireplace along the wall. Both had been stabbed multiple times, and their bodies were rigid. Blood splattered the walls, floor, and curtains. Based on the coagulated state of the blood, the police could determine they had been dead for some time. While Officer Campbell was inspecting the two victims on the first floor, Officer Wang Chung Yi went up to the second floor with his gun drawn. He used his baton to open the door to the sitting room in the corner. Seeing the two children, he shouted, Police! Stay still! But quickly realized both children were already dead. Officer Wang Cheng Yi recounted that he first saw a small child curled up, lying on her side on the bed, curled into a ball with her back against the headboard. This was Ding Huan, the family's younger daughter. The elder daughter, Ding Xin, was found kneeling beside the bed, appearing to be in a praying position. The carpet and bed were covered in dried blood. The forensic report later concluded that Ding Ji Feng had been stabbed 23 times, with numerous defensive wounds on his arms, indicating he had fought back fiercely. In contrast, Kui Gay had been stabbed 13 times and had no defensive wounds, suggesting that the first stab may have incapacitated her. In the upstairs sitting room, the elder daughter, Ding Xin, had been stabbed 10 times, including a stab through her hand, indicating she had tried to defend herself or plead with the attacker. The younger daughter, Ding Huan, had been stabbed four times and had scratch marks on her arms, showing the attacker had restrained her with one hand while stabbing her with the other. The entire scene revealed the brutal and inhumane nature of the attack. On the same day the Ding family's bodies were discovered, Duan Tong was identified by the police as the sole suspect. The police needed to find him quickly. The case, once made public, shocked the entire UK due to its barbaric and violent nature. 
the Northampton Police Department swiftly mobilized its top investigators to focus on this case. First, they began by meticulously reviewing surveillance footage from around Duan Tong's home, nearby train stations, bus stops, and the crime scene vicinity. Additionally, intelligence suggested that Duan Tong might be hiding in the local Chinatown, but the shops and businesses in the area were uncooperative with the police investigation. Hello. 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 Can we come in? No. The One hypothesis suggested that clues about Duan Tong's disappearance might be found in London's Chinatown. However, due to cultural sensitivities, language barriers, and the need for caution, Northampton police had to conduct their search carefully. Shop owners were asked to display wanted posters of Duan Tong, but some refused, considering it bad luck. Others were reluctant to be seen cooperating with the police. As a result, only two shops agreed to the police request. Despite these challenges, there was a breakthrough in analyzing surveillance footage, allowing the police to almost fully reconstruct Duan Tong's movements on the day of the crime. Surveillance video showed that at 10.44 a.m. on April 29th, Duan Tong boarded a train from Coventry to the herbal medicine store in Birmingham. He was carrying his passport. At 11.20 a.m., Duan Tong arrived at the herbal medicine store and stayed there for about 10 minutes. During this time, he wrote a note and placed it in the appointment book, then took a knife from the kitchen and hid it in his backpack. After preparing everything, he put on a hat, shouldered his backpack, and took a train from Birmingham to Northampton. At 12.35 p.m. that same day, Duan Tong got off the train at Northampton Station. He then walked to the Greyfriars bus station and waited at Bay 19. Finally, he boarded bus number 15 at 1.07 p.m. Before getting off the bus at 1.20 p.m., Duan Tong asked the driver for directions to the Wooten area, where Kui Ge's family lived. Perhaps fate tried to intervene, as the driver gave Duan Tong incorrect directions. As a result, even though he was very close to the area, he couldn't find Kui Ge's house following the driver's instructions. However, Duan Tong did not abandon his plan. He wandered around the area, repeatedly asking passers-by for directions. Eventually, with their guidance, he found Kui Ge's house around 3.15 p.m. He walked through the open garage door into the backyard and suddenly attacked Ding Ji Feng, who was in the kitchen. When Kui Ge heard the commotion and rushed in, he immediately stabbed her, preventing her from fighting back. Hearing the screams of the two children upstairs, he frantically ran up and attacked the defenseless girls. According to the police investigation, at 3.32 p.m. on the day of the crime, the local police received a distress call from the elder daughter, Ding Xin. In the 22nd call, the dispatcher could clearly hear the screams and cries of the two girls. Tragically, Ding Xin was unable to speak before the call was disconnected. Sadly, after reporting Ding Xin's phone number and location to the police, the dispatcher misreported the address. Consequently, the police went to Collingwood Park, 3.6 kilometers south of the actual location, missing the chance to save the two girls. After murdering Kui Ge's entire family, Duan Tong did not leave in a hurry. He washed the blood off his hands and left the weapon on the kitchen counter. Perhaps due to staying up all night and being busy all day, he felt exhausted and fell asleep in Kui Ge's house. When he woke up, it was already past 9 p.m. To escape, Duan Tong rummaged through the house and took a wallet along with a set of car keys. At 9.49 p.m., surveillance cameras captured Duan Tong, driving the stolen Corsa at a gas station on the M1 motorway, Junction 15A. He refueled, bought a banana milkshake, and purchased a map of Northampton. Duan Tong did not rush to flee because he still had one more name on his revenge list, Delaney, the person who had caused his bankruptcy. Using the map, Duan Tong drove around but could not find Delaney's house, or perhaps Delaney was not home that night. Frustrated, Duan Tong gave up, drove to London, and parked the car on Venable Street. Since the area where Duan Tong parked only allowed parking on weekends and holidays, by the time the car was discovered, it had accumulated nine parking tickets. After abandoning the car on April 30th, Duan Tong spent $61 to buy a one-way bus ticket from London to Paris. A week later, on May 11th, the police finally found the abandoned car in North London. 
The car was actually rented by the elder daughter, Ding Xin, because the family car was being repaired. Unfortunately, this caused a delay in the investigation, and the police missed the opportunity to arrest Du Tong. On May 24th, Du Tong's image was broadcast on Crime Watch, a popular UK crime show with an audience of 3 to 5 million viewers. The police hoped that airing the case on this show would raise awareness and bring in more leads about Du Tong's whereabouts. Despite abundant physical evidence at the crime scene and numerous clues from surveillance footage, the investigation progressed slowly a year after the crime occurred. With assistance from the Paris police, Northampton police discovered that after arriving in Paris, Du Tong moved to the port city of Algeciras in southern Spain. There, he purchased a one-way ticket to North Africa, with Morocco as his destination, and then disappeared completely. On April 29, 2012, exactly one year after the Ding family's death, a significant figure in the case, Delaney, suddenly passed away from a stroke at the age of 65. This made the death dates of all five individuals involved in the case coincide on the same day. This unbelievable coincidence added even more mystery to the case. Subsequently, the Northampton police traveled to China and Spain to solicit information about the criminal. They believed that after leaving Northampton, Du Antong went to London, where he took a bus to Paris. From there, he was thought to have traveled to Algeciras in Spain, from which he could take a ferry to Tangier in Morocco. Fourteen months after the crime, in July 2012, the case that had once shocked the UK finally saw a significant breakthrough. With the help of Spanish and Moroccan police, local media widely reported on Du Tong's case. Shortly afterward, a Moroccan man called the local police, identifying himself as the foreman of a construction site in the port city of Tangier in northern Morocco. He reported that he recognized Du Tong, the wanted criminal from the news, as the night watchman at his construction site. Upon receiving the tip, Moroccan police immediately went to the construction site to arrest Duan Tong. The chief officer responsible for the arrest recognized that this man had been detained the previous May. At that time, Duan Tong had just arrived in Tangier and was arrested on suspicion of being an illegal immigrant. Duan Tong gave his name as Li Ming and claimed he was from Taiwan. Since the UK police were unaware that Duan Tong had fled to North Africa and the Moroccan police were unaware of the murder case in the UK, they released him after a brief interrogation. This time, after arresting Duan Tong, the Moroccan police immediately informed the British police. The British police quickly traveled to Morocco and confirmed that it was indeed Duan Tong, the man they had been searching for over a year. According to the workers at the construction site, Du Tong had been very secretive since his arrival. Not knowing the local language and lacking proper accommodations, he had to sleep on a makeshift bed at the site. During his more than a year at the construction site, Du Tong's life was extremely difficult. Despite capturing Du Tong, there was a significant issue. There was no extradition treaty between Morocco and the UK. As a result, the two countries had to negotiate extensively. Finally, in February 2013, Duan Tong was extradited to the UK. Faced with overwhelming evidence, Duan Tong admitted to the murders, but claimed that he had been under immense psychological pressure and was mentally unstable before committing the crime, which led to his inability to control his actions. His lawyer argued that Duan Tong should be charged with manslaughter rather than murder. The mental and physical evaluations of Duan Tong extended the case by another eight months. The trial scheduled for May was delayed due to the absence of a Chinese interpreter, causing repeated postponements until the trial finally began in November. On November 28, 2013, Judge Julian Flo of the High Court found Du Tong guilty of murder. The judge determined that Du Tong had meticulously planned and executed the murders from purchasing the knife beforehand to leaving a note for his wife and family, and then going straight to Kui Gay's house in Northampton. Forensic evidence showed that when Du Tong committed the murders, he precisely stabbed the victims in the lungs and heart, causing almost immediate death for the entire family of four. Before the trial, Du Tong told a psychologist that he only intended to carry the knife to reclaim his money. But Ding Jifeng not only refused, 
but also mocked him. However, the judge was skeptical of this story and believed that even if Duan Tong was mentally agitated, it did not prevent him from meticulously planning and brutally carrying out the murders, especially by not sparing the two innocent children. Moreover, after the crime, he sought an opportunity to kill Delaney and then fled abroad, indicating that he was fully aware of his actions. Therefore, the judge rejected the argument for manslaughter and sentenced Duan Tong to life imprisonment with a minimum of 40 years without parole. At 54 years old, Duan Tong would have to serve until he was 94, and it is highly likely he will never leave prison. This case sparked considerable controversy over the police's effectiveness, particularly the handling of Ding Xin's distress call on the day of the crime, which left many people outraged. Following the verdict, the Independent Police Complaints Commission, IPCC, conducted a detailed investigation. Commissioner Amardeep Samal stated that the misrecorded address cost the police precious minutes that could have saved lives. If the police had verified the address more thoroughly, they could have arrived at the correct location within minutes and potentially apprehended Duan Tong at the scene. The IPCC highlighted that the dispatcher was inadequately trained and there were no clear procedures for handling abruptly disconnected emergency calls. After the release of the commission's report, the Northampton Police Department acknowledged that their response to the distress call was disappointing and unacceptable. They wrote a letter of apology to the victim's family, but also stated that even if the police had arrived at the correct address, the chances of saving all four members of Ding Ji Feng's family were slim. Their only likely opportunity would have been to apprehend Du An Tong at the scene. Following the case, Manchester Metropolitan University, where Ding Ji Feng worked, erected a memorial in his honor. Additionally, Kui Ge and Ding Huan's high school planted daffodils in their memory. The most heartbreaking aspect of this case is perhaps the fate of the eldest daughter, Ding Xin. During her high school years, she was a model student, always helping others, and an accomplished violinist. At the time of the incident, Ding Xin was 18 years old and had just finished her university entrance exams. She had received an offer from the University of Nottingham's medical school, but was waiting for her August exam results in hopes of being accepted into the University of Cambridge. Tragically, Ding Xin will never know the outcome. She left behind a promising future that will forever remain unfulfilled. Reflecting on the horrifying case of the Ding family, there is much to discuss. Kui Ge was a patient teacher, polite to colleagues, and devoted to her husband and children, earning praise from friends, colleagues, and superiors. However, human nature is complex and cannot be easily categorized as simply good or bad. In business, Kui Ge seemed to transform into an entirely different person, resembling an extreme utilitarian. Although she promised to share profits equally with Du An Tong, she ultimately delayed payment. When the lawsuit was underway, she transferred her assets and filed for bankruptcy at the last minute, trying every possible way to evade responsibility. While her actions were not illegal, they led to Kui Ge paying the ultimate price with the lives of her entire family. However, what Kui Ge did not anticipate was that a well-educated traditional Chinese medicine doctor like Duan Tong would choose such an extreme and brutal path. Perhaps Kui Ge's utilitarianism ignited the tragedy, plunging her and her family into calamity. Since the incident, many people have expressed sympathy for Duan Tong. They believe that before the crime, he was a good person a genuine traditional Chinese medicine doctor who tried to resolve the issue legally when Kui Ge deceived him. He patiently waited for justice, but when he realized that the legal system was flawed and unable to resolve his issue, the injustice and frustration may have pushed him to the brink of crime. Of course, we cannot justify Duan Tong's actions through sympathy, especially when he directed his anger towards the two innocent daughters of the victims, Acts of violence and murder are always deserving of condemnation. Dear viewers, remember, violence is never the answer to any problem. Thank you for watching today's video. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications so you don't miss any future videos. See you in the next one.